the others have been so far, so this one is actually my longest one, so we're going to make up for it this week. So I mean, I'm glad that I know, right? I'm glad they only did one song. You know? <laughs> you know if you told me earlier, we wouldn't have had that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell, you, I tell you though, this is it's my longest class. This is the most notes I've got on any of my classes, but I rehearsed it. And it when I when I went over it one last time, it wasn't too bad. So. Yeah. Uh, that's okay. We're just made up for his today. When I get to the end, I'll just start launching into story after story after story. <laughs> Let's go ahead and uh, start with the word of prayer tonight. Father God, in the name of Jesus, as we come before you, God, Lord, we're so grateful for this time together that we can meet and gather in your house, Lord, and learn of your word. God, I depend upon the anointing of God, Lord, to use me for this great work, Jesus, and teaching this class, God. And we've worked hard together, me and you, God. We got together, Lord, we've studied and we prayed and you showed me things, God. And now the time is here and the time is now to show this unto the people, to reveal these things to people, God. Lord, that the word of God is being made a living reality greater than ever before, God. You're moving upon us, Lord. And it's not just about me, but it's about everyone here tonight, God. That we can learn of your word and we can see your word, God, being revealed in us, Lord. And it's all part of a great purpose for this final hour, Lord. We love you, Jesus. we praise you, we submit everything <coughs> to you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Uh, so I've talked a lot in uh, the past few weeks about what I call Bible maximalists, and that term refers to uh, Bible teachers, uh, archaeologists who believe that the Bible is factual. Uh, and mostly I've talked about an archaeologist named David Roll, and last week I talked about Dr. Brian Wood, uh, and there's one more that I haven't even discussed, and he's one of the biggest uh, figures in Bible archaeology and one of the leading voices of Bible maximalist and his name is Kenneth Kitchen and uh, just out of respect I want to talk about him a little bit uh, he has amazing credentials uh, he's the professor uh, of Bible studies at the University of Liber Liverpool uh, he is a big voice in art archaeology and even though he's a Bible maximalist and he believes that the Bible is historical fact uh, he still is a respected voice in the archaeological community. And just like David Roll, uh, Kenneth Kitchen is one of the world's leading authorities on Egyptology. And um, he's even written a book, it's called On the Reliability of the Old Testament. Uh, it's a very influential book. And he's also written one about uh, Ramses the Great, uh, the most famous and uh, uh, powerful pharaoh that there ever was, Ramses the Second. And it's called Pharaoh Triumphant. And even secular historians acknowledge it's probably one of the the most informative books on the Pharaoh Ramses that's ever been written. Uh, so he has garnered a lot of respect. But the thing about it is, uh, you know, David Roll is one of the world's leading experts on Egyptology, and so is Kenneth Kitchen. And these two men absolutely hate each other. <laughs> and it was actually, it's actually fascinating to read. Uh, they, they are arch enemies in the archaeological community, even though both men uh, do believe that the Bible is historical truth. Um, Basically, as I said before, the thing is, uh, Kenneth Kitchen believes in the traditional chronology. Now, and we've talked about the new chronology and all these classes, and I, I hope I've made a very convincing case that the, the traditional chronology model for the ancient world in archaeology is wrong, and it's outdated, and it needs to be reworked. With new discoveries, you have to keep changing the chronology so it accurately reflects the newest findings in Archaeologists uh, uh, in the academic community, for the most part, they're just not willing to do that. They're not willing to, to reject, uh, or they're not willing to accept the new research. They're only willing to cling on to the old chronology. The new chronology has been proving the Bible. It's been putting the uh, Bible stories in the proper time period in which they took place, and that's when the evidence for them has been found. Now, what's interesting here is that um, Kenneth Kitchen is actually a Christian, and uh, David Roll is, uh, as I've said before, is an agnostic. He doesn't necessarily believe in God, and he believes in the historical truth of the Bible. So David Roll has proposed a new chronology, and in doing so, he has found and unearthed the evidence for the stories in the Bible. So why does Kenneth Kitchen reject his work? It's kind of interesting. And it, it's interesting to read the two of them writing really, really scathing critiques of one another in their different books. You know, uh, you know, David Roll's an idiot. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He's wrong about this, this, and this. And then David Roll says the same thing about Kenneth Kitchen. It's funny watching uh, angry debates between archaeologists. Uh, and especially if you're not an expert and you read that and you think, man, I have no idea what either of these two are talking about. But um, uh, the thing about it is, the reason I've 
uh, chosen David Roll over Kenneth Kitchen, even though Kitchen is a Christian, is because David Roll has presented more evidence than Kenneth Kitchen has. And uh, Kenneth Kitchen totally rejects the new chronology, and he still embraces the old chronology. But the thing about it is, he knows, and he even admits, that the evidence for the stories in the Bible really can't be found in the, in the old chronology. He even admits it. And so, uh, to basically explain what the difference between the two of them is, uh, we have, again, I've showed you time and time again, the old chronology versus the new chronology. And uh, this is sort of, I've sort of cut off the old kingdom and I've just made it focusing just on the middle kingdom and the new kingdom. So on the top here, this is the old chronology. On the bottom here, this is the new chronology. So the traditional chronology uh, shows the middle kingdom coming to an end in about 1800 BC. And then it has the Hyksos invasion happening right towards the end of it. And then Egypt was ruled by these foreign invaders called the Hyksos, and this lasts until the New Kingdom. And then it places Ramses the Great, his reign is at about 1279 to 1213 B.C. And you probably can't see that tiny font. Uh, it, it was kind of hard to compress all this information on the screen. I, I did the best I could. But it places the Exodus at about 1250 B.C. And it assumes that Ramses the Great was the pharaoh of the Exodus if the Exodus occurred. Uh, and then later on in history, we have what's called uh, uh, the Pharaoh Shoshank I, uh, who in, uh, invaded Israel on a military campaign. And most traditional chronologists believe that Shoshank is actually the King Shishak from the Bible. Uh, but in the new chronology, we found something completely different. And see, this is the problem. This is why so many people, historians, archaeologists, skeptics, non-believers, they don't want to accept the... Bible is fact because there's no evidence that the Exodus actually took place during the reign of Ramses the Great. Uh, amongst the ruins of Ramses's era, there's no mention of the Israelite slaves, of the, uh, uh, of the ten plagues, of, of Moses, or anything like that. So in our class, we've changed the chronology, and we've uh, actually put together this whole thing like a puzzle. The Middle Kingdom actually ends in 1416 B.C., the Hyksos invasion actually takes place right after the Exodus. The Exodus has moved back about 200 years, and uh, we found evidence that it did take place at the end of Egypt's Middle Kingdom. And uh, what that means is that the events of the Exodus actually are what caused the end of Middle Kingdom era Egypt. And when the Pharaoh's army drowned in the Red Sea, this is what led to the Hyksos invasion, which took place immediately <coughs> afterwards. So these disastrous events actually uh, ushered in the Second Intermediate Period. Uh, and then many, many years later, we have Ramses the Great reigning during the New Kingdom in a totally different time period. The old chronology is off by hundreds of years. 1279 to 1213 versus 943 to 877. This is the newly proposed date for the reign of Ramses the Great. And we've determined that, determined that Ramses is actually Shishak from the Bible, the Pharaoh who uh, attacked Jerusalem and plundered Solomon's temple immediately after the death of King Solomon. So we're going to talk about that tonight for the most part. Uh, again, the problem is that uh, there is evidence that the Exodus took place at the end of the Middle Kingdom, at the end of the 13th dynasty of Egypt. Because we've, we've gone into all the evidence. The city of Avaris is suddenly abandoned. The admonitions of Ippor, the ancient papyrus shows, describes in vivid detail the ten plagues occurring. So there is evidence that it took place here, and there's no evidence that it took place in the New Kingdom. And Kenneth Kitchen is what's called a New Kingdom theorist. He believes that the Exodus occurred during the New Kingdom and just wants to assume that Ramses the Great was the Pharaoh of the Exodus. And that's because, again, Ramses being the Pharaoh of the Exodus comes from a long tradition, going back to the Charlton Heston movie, The Ten Commandments, or The Prince of Egypt, the, uh, uh, that animated movie. You know, we, we, we really want Ramses to be the Pharaoh of the Exodus because he's the most famous Pharaoh that there ever was. And it's just hard to let go of that. You know, it's just been ingrained in our minds for so many years. But when we accept that he was not the Pharaoh of the Exodus, that a lesser known Pharaoh from the late Middle Kingdom was the Pharaoh of the Exodus, then we actually can uncover evidence for the story having actually taken place. Uh, so I think Kenneth Kitchen is just simply, uh, while he is a great archaeologist and a lot smarter than me, and I have the utmost respect for him, He's just fallen into that easy trap of wanting, really, really wanting Ramses to be the pharaoh of the Exodus. And when I've read uh, what New Kingdom theorists have to say uh, in explaining why there's no evidence uh, for the Exodus having taken place, 
at the end of the new, uh, during the new kingdom, they say, well, the, 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 the exodus was so terrible that they just didn't make any mention of it. Like, like uh, the ten plagues and, and uh, uh, the exodus and Pharaoh's army being drowned in the Red Sea. Well, they just didn't make mention of it because it was so embarrassing to them. They only made record of their victories. And I just think that's kind of a cop I, I think that's kind of lame because apparently there is record of such disastrous events occurring. It just takes place in a different time period. Um, so that's, uh, uh, that's why I respect Kenneth Kitchen but disagree with him on this and why I've accepted David Roll's proposed model. He just presents more evidence. So tonight we're going to learn some things about New Kingdom Egypt. We talked about the Old Kingdom. That's the, that's the uh, era of early Egyptian reign and that's when uh, Abraham came onto the scene. And then the Middle Kingdom is when Moses and the Exodus occurs. Now, the new chronology has uh, uncovered something very interesting. As David Roll has been spent his years constructing the new chronology and investigating it and looking into the historical research, he looked into New Kingdom Egypt and he uncovered something very, very interesting. And that if the new chronology is correct, that means that the reigns of King Saul, King David, and King Solomon all would have taken place during New Kingdom Egypt. So instead of uh, Ramses being the pharaoh of the Exodus, Ramses lived after King David and after King Solomon. So that means that mention of these famous Hebrew kings would be made during uh, the Egyptian New Kingdom. So uh, of all the hundreds of pharaohs, we tend to look back on Egypt and we, we tend to forget, we, we sort of put Egypt all together in our minds. We just think of Egypt, we think of pyramids and pharaohs and, and uh, hieroglyphics and uh, you know, dance like an Egyptian, and, and it all, it's like this Egyptian montage goes off in our minds, and we forget Egypt lasted over 2,000 years. It had a very, very, very long history, and there were hundreds of pharaohs. So it's unlikely to me that the pharaoh of the Exodus would just happen to be the most famous, uh, recognizable pharaoh of all. It's more reasonable to me to assume that the Exodus pharaoh would have been one of the lesser-known pharaohs from earlier in time. So I think there's a tendency to try to force the Bible stories into Egyptian history where they don't belong, into more exciting places, instead of where they fit naturally. So we're going to try to fit these stories into Egyptian history uh, naturally tonight. Um, so uh, as we look at this tonight, uh, we're going to study the New Kingdom era of Egypt. And when you think of Egypt, uh, you're really remembering, uh, you're probably thinking of the images in your mind comes from the New Kingdom. The New Kingdom is sort of Egypt at the height of its powers. That's when Egypt grew to its highest point, when it was really, uh, its territory had expanded the furthest. That was uh, them at the height of their military might, when Pharaoh's army grew to the biggest. And um, so we're gonna sort of study what happened and uh, uh, learn a few things about New Kingdom Egypt, because it's a very, very interesting history. So the New Kingdom starts with a pharaoh named Akmos, and this is from the year in the New Chronology, 1202 to 1178 BC. So what happens is, remember what I said last week, or uh, it was the week before actually, uh, after the Exodus, Pharaoh's army is drowned in the Red Sea, so he has no more army. So this leads to a hostile invasion of foreign tribes, and we call them the Hyksos. Uh, and this was a, a band of confederate tribes from the desert, violent warlike tribes that just got together and invaded Egypt and conquered it. And so the Hyksos invasion then lasted for a few hundred years and the Egyptians were conquered and they were weak and they were helpless and the Hyksos enslaved the Egyptians, you know, totally enslaved them and, uh, you know, they had had the Israelites as slaves, now they were the slaves. And so this lasted for a few hundred years. And so what happens is Akmos is the pharaoh who leads a rebellion against the Hyksos. And the Hyksos, we even determined the Israelites, when they were escaping Egypt, they ran into the Amalekites and had a battle. And we even determined that the Amalekites were one of the Hyksos tribes that invaded Egypt. So you can kind of see how everything starts to fit together. So uh, Akmos leads the revolt against the, uh, against the Hyksos. And what they had done is they, uh, the Avaris, the city of Avaris was the Israelite settlement. So it was evacuated, and then the Hyksos came in, and when they conquered Egypt, they set up camp there. And they occupied that as the city that they ruled over Egypt out of. So, Akmos leads a rebellion, uh, and he basically says, we've had enough, we're tired of being ruled by these foreigners. He gathers up the Egyptians, he forms an army, they have a, a, a revolt and an uprising 
against the Hyksos and they defeat them and they conquer them and they shove them out of their land. And then they all celebrate and dance in the streets. Egypt is free again. We're free from the rule of the Hyksos. We've, we've done it. We've cast them out. We've won back our freedom. So then what happens is kind of a bloody gruesome event. The Hyksos don't have anywhere to go. Uh, so they're basically, they're, they fled into the desert and now they're looking for a new homeland. And what happens next, uh, it, it almost reminded me of the Native American story, The Trail of Tears. Basically, as the Hyksos were fleeing for their lives, the Egyptians pursued them. The Egyptian army pursued them and just kept slaughtering them and kept slaughtering them. And they were merciless. And there's actually genocide committed against some of the tribes. This was, this was a, clearly a campaign of revenge that Akmos carried out against the Hyksos. So the Hyksos fled and many of their tribes were completely slaughtered and annihilated from the face of the earth. And as they kept running, trying to hide and find a new place to go, they eventually settled in the coastal plains of Philistia. And they began to build cities and settle there. And they became what we know as the biblical Philistines. Remember that the Philistines weren't there when, uh, uh, when Joshua was doing the conquest of the Promised Land. Uh, it's not mentioned, the, uh, the, uh, the Philistines aren't mentioned anywhere. So they clearly came into being after the conquest of the Promised Land. So uh, they settled the coastal plains of Philistia, and Pharaoh Achmos has them cornered. He still hunts them down, and he's ready to kill them off, every single last one of them. But they uh, basically, they, they can't do anything in self-defense. They're hopelessly outnumbered, so they're left pleading for their lives. Uh, the Hyksos, the, the, the few Hyksos that have survived and made it to Philistia are basically begging and pleading for their lives. But Pharaoh has an idea. Instead of killing them all, he signs a peace treaty with the Philistines. And this is, in history, this is called the Via Maris. This is a peace treaty he signs because Pharaoh actually sees an advantage here. That uh, as, we look, as we look at this map, this is what the Promised Land sort of looks like. And so this is Philistia. This is the coastal plain of, the, of Philistia. This is where the Philistines are located, down here. So they're, they're left begging for their lives. Well, Pharaoh wants to rebuild Egypt. He wants to make it a powerful kingdom again, make Egypt great again. So what he does, he realizes he has an opportunity. Uh, there are trade routes that he can open up along the Mediterranean Sea. In the northern kingdoms like Phoenicia and all the way up here to Indo-Europe, which is off the map. Well, there are a group of people that Pharaoh is concerned about, and they occupy this land here. Now, these are the former slaves, the Israelites, but they've now conquered the Promised Land and they've now settled in this area. So uh, while the Israelites viewed this as a land flowing with milk and honey, Pharaoh didn't really view it that way. He viewed this as a backwater, backwater a, a political land with no king, just a bunch of confederations. He viewed them as a bunch of hillbillies. He looked at them the same way we might look at West Virginia today. He's like, oh. So Pharaoh... <laughs> <laughs> or if you're from Georgia like I am, uh, this, this is how we view the Alabamians. So, <laughs> so um, uh, he wants to open up trade routes because that will uh, help Egypt grow its empire again and, and grow in magnificence and wealth and all of that. Um, so what he realizes, I need to keep these people in order. These people who live in this area, these backwoods people, I don't want them causing any trouble. I don't want them, I, I don't know if I can trust them. They might be violent, warlike people. There are former slaves from many generations past who escaped. Uh, so he realizes he can spare the Philistines instead of wiping them all out, and he can begin to actually pay them to keep these people in check. So the Philistines, uh, he basically signs an agreement with them that he'll just pay them money and uh, send them, you know, soldiers and supplies. And as a result, they can be a police force for the northern part of his kingdom to keep his trade routes safe with Indo-Europe and with Phoenicia and with all the northern kingdoms up here. So in uh, biblical history, we call this the era of the judges. This is when the, what, what we call the Philistine oppression begins. So when we look at this tonight, we're going to realize something that... Uh, this is going to change the way that you look at uh, the, the book of uh, First and Second Samuel. It, it's going to cast it in a new light for you. And what it also does is it, is it casts a new light in New Kingdom Egypt. Because the traditional chronology doesn't have New Kingdom Egypt and, um, and uh, the birth of the, of the Kingdom of Israel at the same time. 
But if we put them together and, and see them happening at the same time, we're going to see how amazingly they uh, complement one another. It's like two giant puzzle pieces that fit perfectly together that you never realize it. And so when you put them together, you see just how that how perfectly they fit together. And that's going to help us really bring this uh, story to life. It's going to really cast new light uh, on 1 Samuel when you realize it's all taking place in the shadow of Egypt, the Egyptians. So the Philistines are now hired hands. They're like a, a hired police force to oppress and keep down and keep suppressed the Israelite uh, people here to protect Pharaoh's trade routes uh, from the north. And so during this time period, this uh, becomes a dark age for the Israelites because this is the period of the judges. And so we have a new Pharaoh who arrives on the scene. Uh, when, we, when we study, let me go back a little bit. Uh, as we go through the, uh, through the 18th dynasty and we go down to the 10th ruler, we have this pharaoh here who we're going to talk about, and his name is Akhenaten. Right. Akhenaten is one of the most controversial pharaohs in Egyptian history. The 10th ruler of the 18th dynasty had more influence over Egypt probably than any other pharaoh, and he's still controversial to this very day. Now, the thing you have to understand about the Egyptians is that they didn't like change. That's one of the cultural things, if you really study ancient Egypt, you realize that they have ancient writings and ancient poems that say things like, uh, they pray to the gods, let the seasons come, let the seasons go, let the sun rise, let the sun set, and let it never end. They don't like change, and that's why they built such elaborate tombs for the pharaohs. The idea was, we want to build an entire universe underneath the pyramid where the pharaoh can sleep and be undisturbed for all eternity. They don't like change. So Akhenaten is the pharaoh of change, and uh, that's, that's almost what he's known for. If you look at him, even his statue looks a little bit strange, because uh, the pharaohs usually have very uh, plain features. When we, when we look at the statues of the pharaohs, the sphinx, or, or uh, all the magnificent statues, they all have blank expressions, maybe kind of a little smile, and they're just sort of looking forward. There's nothing, you, you really can't tell one from the other. They all kind of look the same. Akhenaten looks totally different. He does not look anything at all like any of the other pharaohs. He's, he's grotesque looking. He has giant bug, uh, giant lips. Uh, he has... Pretty lips. I'd like to have them lips. You, you, well, <laughs> Women, yeah, come on, really, help me now. <laughs> he has a really skinny, long face like a horse, and he has narrow eyes. And If you see a full statue of him... <laughs> Uh, his statues are so unusual. He has long, twisted, gangly limbs, and he has a pot belly. He looks nothing at all like the pharaoh was traditionally depicted. Um, and there's all kinds of controversial uh, theories out there about Akhenaten, about why he was so different among the Egyptian pharaohs. Uh, some have said he was deformed, or uh, perhaps a product of inbreeding. Uh, and yes, you guessed it, there are some people out there who think he might have been an alien. Oh, wow. <laughs> Akhenaten was not an alien. It just, uh, the story that they're telling here in the statue is what an agent of radical change he was. How he was attempting to force change on the Egyptian people against their will. But here's the most interesting thing about Akhenaten. This is what he's most known for. He was monotheist. He only worshipped one god. He did not worship the other gods of Egypt. Now it wasn't the true god. It was, actually he worshipped a, a god named Aten. Aten was the god of the light of the day. So he wasn't the sun god like Ra. Uh, he was a minor god. He was one of the lesser gods. But he was the only god that Akhenaten worshipped. And so Akhenaten tried to force radical monotheistic change on the rest of Egypt. And that's a, it's a fascinating thing to read about because the Egyptians were so into the worship of their, their gods. Akhenaten said, no, forget about all those gods. You're not allowed to worship them anymore. There's only one god and that's Aten. The, the, the noonday sun god. And the people of Egypt are scratching their heads and they don't want it. it. It would be like us saying, you know, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They're not really God anymore. It turns out, you know, uh, the cross was God all along and you have to worship the cross and you can't worship God anymore. It, it didn't make any sense. And uh, he tried to force that. The priests are infuriated. He closes down and banishes the worship of the, of the temple of the other gods and only allows worship of Aten. Now, in some retrospect, it does make a little sense why Akhenaten did this to Egypt. 
He was attempting to go back to a more old-fashioned form of worship, because originally the Egyptians had worshipped the sun, and the other gods had kind of just sort of sprang up over time. So he was trying to banish all the other gods and go back to a more pure form of worship. So he forced monotheism on Egypt. Um, uh, however, there's another interesting side to the story, and again, David Roll is the only one who I've seen bring this up, is that uh, um, when Akhenaten was little, when he was being raised in the court of Pharaoh in the school, he had a mentor who educated him named Abdel. And if you know anything about uh, biblical history, you know, you've noticed that a lot of the names of people in the Bible have the word L in their name, E-L, Samuel, Daniel. Um, and the reason for that is because El was one of the original names of God before Moses. So um, uh, the name El appears over and over again in Israelite history, yet somehow there is a worshiper of El that ends up in the court of Pharaoh. So apparently not every Israelite had left Egypt during the Exodus, and one of them actually still served in the court of Pharaoh. And so an Israelite somehow had raised Akhenaten, now, Akhenaten didn't worship El. He didn't worship the Hebrew God. He worshipped one God, though, and he tried to force that. So in the light of Akhenaten's reforms, as he tries to force monotheism on Egypt, Egypt's strength and influence over the northern kingdom, and those, remember those, those trade routes in the Mediterranean that I talked about, their power starts to wane, uh, and, and his strength and his grip over the northern part of the kingdom starts to crumble a little bit. So now, all of a sudden, the oppressed people of the Canaan region see an opportunity. They realize we can rise up and uh, we can begin to rebel against our Philistine oppressors. But the problem is they don't have a military. They don't, they don't even have a king. And now all of a sudden, 1 Samuel 8, verses 4 through 5, makes a little more sense in a new light now. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel and to Ramah and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us all like all the nations. So now all of a sudden there's a scripture in the Bible that makes a little more sense now that it's placed in the proper historical context. As Egypt's uh, grip on the northern kingdom begins to crumble, now the Israelites see an opportunity to, uh, to rebel against, uh, against Egyptian domination in the region and against the Philistines. So, in uh, 1012 BC, according to the New Chronology, a new king arises from the Canaan region attempting to unite the people in a revolt against the Philistines. And now, during this time period, uh, even before that it was revealed in, in the new chronology, historians did have a name for this rebellion, and it's called the Canaanite Rebellion. So when the Canaanite Rebellion starts, a series of letters are sent to the pharaoh, uh, and we have these letters today, so we're going to look at these letters and see what they say. These are called the El Amarna tablets. Now, it's a lot easier to say Armana, and I'm probably going to mix up and say that a lot, the Armana tablets, but it's not Armana, it's Amarna. So the R goes in a different place. So the city of Amarna was built by Akhenaten, and in the ruins of this city, we found a treasure trove of these ancient tablets. Uh, and what they are, uh, they were first discovered in 1887. There's over 300 of them, and they are on display in museums around the world. And this is a huge archaeological find. In fact, it, it reveals a lot of details about the ancient world. Now, there's another important principle that I've taught you all earlier, and it's that because of its milder climate, Egypt is actually uh, the best place to get a glimpse into the ancient world. because. While archaeological ruins crumble in places like Israel and in the harsh deserts of the Middle East, the milder climate actually helps Egypt preserve things better. Not only that, but the Egyptians were better record keepers. So we have more knowledge of what happened in ancient Egypt than we do our own medieval European Middle Ages. We have like you know three times more ancient documents from Egypt than we do from uh, the European uh, from the Middle Ages. So. Uh, while we can't learn a lot from like uh, uh, Assyria or from Israel because uh, all of those ancient ruins and monuments have all kind of uh, gone into decay, Egypt is one of our greatest windows into the ancient world because we actually have letters that the Egypts we, we have their, the Egyptians communicated with other kingdoms, so we know what was going on in those other kingdoms through the letters they sent back and forth to the Egyptians. So what do we know about the El Amarna tablets? They cover a 30-year period. 
and they focus on the Canaanite uprising. Uh, some of these letters are from Akhenaten himself to the kings and governors of the Canaan region. Others are, most of them are from the Canaan, uh, Canaan region, Canaan foreign leaders to Akhenaten, uh, forming, uh, informing him about what's going on. So we can reconstruct the entire war and the entire drama that played it, uh, took place over this wartime period through these accounts, the rebellion against Egypt's leadership in the Canaan region. And what's interesting is that when you read the story here, and we, we've been able to put together the entire war that played out, it is literally an exact match with the book of First and Second Samuel. It's an exact match. The story that plays out is exactly the same from the Bible. And we're going to dig deep into that tonight and really see for ourselves. And it's actually kind of amazing. It kind of blows your mind as you start reading this. But there's one gigantic difference. There's one thing that's different about this, and that's the names. Now, while the story that plays out is exactly the same as the, the story in the Bible, the names are all different. So that's what we have to address and get into first. Remember something I told you all earlier. Names don't mean anything. <laughs> names in the ancient world are very... The thing is, there are a lot of kings and a lot of world leaders in the ancient world that went by many different names. Not only that, but in many cases, their names were translated in different languages to other people. So a lot of the names that we call people from the Bible wasn't really their name, that's just the modern English version of their name. And so the best example is Jesus. You know, Jesus is an English translation of the Greek version of his name, but his real name uh, in Hebrew originally was Yeshua. But it really doesn't matter. When you pray to Jesus, God knows who you're talking to. So <laughs> I'm sure the Lord... It's just a lot easier to say, Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Jesus, well, Jesus. Yeah, you... Uh, <laughs> You talk to the Jews for Jesus. I'm sure they have a Yeshua, Yeshua yeah, sure. um, somewhere. So when we look into the El Amarna letters, this is the <laughs> drama that we see play out. There's a king named Labiah, who's the leader of the Canaanite rebellion. He has a son named Mutball. <laughs> I'm not really pronouncing that right. It's not Mutball. It's Mutbell. Uh, but that, that's almost too easy to fall into. He has a son who's not named that he views as, as a traitor. Uh, he's, there's a powerful man named Yeshua who has a son named Elhanan. Labiah is jealous of Elhanan because Elhanan slew a Philistine warrior named Galatu. Elhanan is on the run from King Labiah for most of his life, but then later becomes another powerful king. Labiah is killed at a battle at Mount Gilboa, Gilboa and Elhanan becomes a new king named Dadua. This is what the El Amarna letters tell us. Now, if you read First and Second uh, Samuel, this is the exact same story. King Saul has a son instead of Mutzbel. His name is Ishbosheth. He has a son named Jonathan that he views as a traitor. He's killed at battle at Mount Gilboa. You, instead of Yushua, you have Jesse, uh, who has a son named David who slew Goliath and became King David. So, what's going on here? Why are the names different? That's our first question. Well, remember, names were very, very different in, in different cultures around the world. So, uh, oh, and by the way, too, this is what's also interesting, is, uh, is we read um, the El Amarna letters, we can actually see uh, Leviah's kingdom, the kingdom that he was able to conquer before he was killed at the battle at Mount Gil, uh, Gilboa. And it's exactly the same uh, kingdom, exactly the same as Saul's kingdom, as described in the Bible. Uh, so... Uh, David Roll has gone through the El Amarna letters and he's identified, uh, here's all the different names that he's identified uh, with biblical characters. Achish, king of Gath, is identified with Suor Darta, king of Gath in the Amarna letters. Achish is believed to be a shortened form of the Hurrian name Akishimigji, the sun God has given. Suor Darta is an Indo-European name meaning the sun God has given. Aziru of the Amarna letters is identified with Hadadezar, the Syrian king in 2 Samuel. Labiah, ruler in the Armana letters, is King Saul. King David with Dadua in Armana letter EA-256. Mutbel, writer of the letter, <laughs> is identified with Ishbel, a.k.a. Ishbosheth, because Ishbosheth, the first son of Saul, is named Ishbel in some versions. The two names have exactly the same meaning, man of Bel. Following the death of his father, Labiah slash Saul, Mutbel slash Ishbel, moves his center to Transjordan. The sons of Labiah in the Armana letter 250 with Mutbel, Ishbel, and David slash Dadua, the latter being the son-in-law of Labiah uh, slash Shal. Benanima, 
also mentioned in EA 256, is identified by role with Bayana, Israelite chieftain in 2 Samuel 4, who would later betray and assassinate Ishbosheth. Yeshua, also mentioned in EA 256, EA stands for El Amarna letter. And the, the number here identifies the order in which the El Amarna tablets were found. So this is the 256 uh, El Amarna letter that was discovered. It's identified with Jesse, Ishea in Hebrew, father of David. Ahab, the subject of EA 256, is held to be the same as the biblical Joab. Lupaku, man of Paku, uh, uh, Aramean command, army commander in the Amarna letters with Shobak, uh, he of Paku. See, they're the same name. Or Aramean com army commander in the Bible. All right, so now why are their names so different? Well, now, what Roll is proposed here is the most interesting thing that I read about this whole story. First of all, the name Shaul, or Saul, comes from the Hebrew Shaul, which means asked for. So, uh, I taught you all this last week. When a person became king in the ancient world, very often they took on a different name, a new name, a royal name. Uh, and this happens all throughout history. And so, uh, for example, if Saul, if his name means asked for, he was identified as the king who was asked for. Remember, they asked for a king. So logically, why would his name be Saul from birth? Why would that be his birth name? It doesn't make any sense. He was about 40 years old when he became king, according to the Bible. So it only makes sense that when he, he would have had a different birth name. Now, uh, Roll points out that the name Labiah actually means the mighty lion of Yah. So it's been assumed by historians for many years that uh, this must have been just some random Canaanite king because the Canaanites, before the Israelites arrived on the scene, did worship a god named Ea, Ea but this is spelled Yah, Y-A. So Roll proposes, and I agree with him on this, that Yah is actually a, an abbreviation of Yahweh because this is, everything's kind of starting to fall into place here. Uh, and I've taught this on my Wednesday night classes. The Israelites had such respect and high regard for God that, you know, you weren't allowed to enter the holiest of holies or you'd be killed because the glory of God was so powerful there. So uh, if people uh, uh, wanted to name their child after Yahweh, they couldn't because Yahweh is the sacred name of God that was given to Moses. And according to the ancient Israelites, if you even spoke the name Yahweh, you would die from it. You couldn't speak the name of God. And so it makes sense that they would use a shortened or abbreviated version of his name. So uh, something else that I, uh, as I was reading this, this is something else that occurred to me. Um, the Egyptians, we're going to see, had a lot of animosity towards this king, and they didn't really recognize him as a king. Uh, they, they viewed this as an illegitimate rebellion against their leadership. So why would they actually call him Shaul? Now, it's very possible that when Labiah became king, he was called Saul and called himself Saul, and the Bible calls him Saul, but the Egyptians would have refused to call him that because that was his royal name, and they wouldn't have wanted to recognize his kingship or his, his royalness. So everything about it actually does make sense. Now, the same is true of Elhanan. Elhanan is the young man who's on the run for his life in the El Amarna letters, and it means El shows favor. The name Dadua means Yasho's favor. So, uh, according to the Bible, when David is anointed king, he goes on the run for his life, right? And so during this time period, he's got a band of really loyal followers, and uh, King Saul is jealous and is pursuing him. And David Roll points out that the name Dadua is actually a Hurrian name. And what this means is that there were some people like Hurrians and Hittites who joined with David in his army. And they would have eventually given him this name, which means Yah, which the same name from Labiah, Yah or Yahweh shows favor. So when he becomes King Dadua, the Hebrew uh, name DWD or DUD, because remember, uh, in Hebrew they didn't have consonants. In ancient Hebrew, they, or they only had consonants, they didn't have vowels. So uh, if you take the vowels out of this, you end up with DWD or DUD or DVD which is where we would have gotten the name David from. So Dadua, which is a Hurrian name, uh, would have been Hebrewized and eventually become the name David, which was what we call him David. Now in the, uh, in the El Amarna letters, King Dadua, when he's on the run for his life, uh, he's referred to as a, the Egyptian word is Aparu, which is an old word from uh, the kingdom, which means the wandering people. It's a slang term. It's an insult. It's kind of viewed as the same thing as like what we call people gypsies today. 
know, people who we, we sort of associate they're dirty and they don't bathe and they're just a bunch of wanderers and they don't have a homeland of their own. We, we kind of have that discrimination against people like that. So the word was an insult. Egyptians are going to refer to them as Aparu. Uh, in the Hurrian language, this would have been called the Haberu, which means the wandering people. So uh, Elhanan, or King Dadawa, and his wandering band of Hurrian and mixture and Israelite uh, soldiers who were loyal to him are eventually called the Habaru. And this is where we get the word Hebrew. And eventually, Habaru would become synonymous with the entire Israelite people as a whole. And I think that's a pretty interesting theory. The, the tradition has told us, the Bible doesn't really say this, but tradition has told us for many years that uh, the word Hebrew actually comes from, because one of Abraham's ancestors was named Eber in the Bible. And just like uh, the descendants of Abraham are called Semites after his ancestor Shem. They're also called Hebrews after his ancestor Eber. But uh, David Roll says this isn't right, that actually the name Habru is where we get the word Hebrew from. So again, all of this is very interesting stuff. Um, what I think personally is when we see this drama play out, it so closely resembles the drama that plays out in First and Second Samuel, it just couldn't be a coincidence. And especially how perfectly everything lines up in the New Kingdom. Uh, so let's Let's take a closer look at some of the EA letters, and we'll sort of more closely examine this war that breaks out. And so the first one we have is EA number 252, uh, which says, It was in war uh, the town was seized. Now this is a letter that King Labiah, as soon as he starts the Canaanite rebellion against Egyptian authority, and he begins to unite this kingdom, he sends a letter to Pharaoh Akhenaten explaining what he's doing. And he seems very defiant. He just really, it's kind of amazing to see how he speaks. This is the most powerful man in the world. This is like the president of the United States today. This is just some backwoods kingdom. You know, by what authority does he claim to talk to Pharaoh this way? He says, after I had sworn my oath to keep the peace, and when I swore, the Egyptian governor swore with me, the town along with my God was seized. Now, it's interesting that he says, my God, which shows that Labiah was apparently monotheistic. And now I am slandered before the king, my lord. Moreover, if an ant is struck, does it not fight back and bite the hand of the man that struck it? How could I hold back this day when two of my towns, he's referring to Gibeah and Michmash, have been seized? I will keep in prison the men who seized the town and my God. They are the despoilers of my father, and so I will keep them. So Akhenaten is probably shocked when he receives this letter and sees by what defiance and what arrogance this Canaanite king talks to the most powerful king on earth. And uh, there's another one, EA245. When we look at this, this is another letter that um, Labiah sends to Akhenaten. And I'm going to compare this to a scripture, and we're going to see how closely these two match. Moreover, the king wrote concerning my son, I did not know that my son was consorting with the Habaru. I herewith hand him over to Adiah, the Egyptian commissioner. And now let's compare this to 1 Samuel 20. Then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan, and he said unto him, Thou son of a the perverse, rebellious woman. Do not I know that thou hast chosen the son of Jesse to thine own confusion and unto the confusion of thy mother's nakedness? For as long as the son of Jesse liveth upon the ground, thou shalt not be established, nor thy kingdom. Wherefore now send and fetch him unto me, for he shall surely die. Wow. All right, so in, uh, uh, as we see this war play out, we can actually see a change that begins to take place in, uh, in this character, Labiah. We see how at first he's monotheistic and he is also incredibly defiant and, and really has the audacity to stand up to Pharaoh. But as we see him change throughout the course of the war, we see him turn into kind of a groveling, pitiful fool. The same progression that King Saul went through. And now let's look at EA 253 and this next letter that he sent to Akhenaten. This is close to the end. To the king, my lord and my son, thus I, Labiah, your servant in the dirt upon which you tread, Seven times and seven do fall at the feet of the king, my lord. I have obeyed the orders that the king, my lord, wrote me on a tablet. I am a servant of the king like my father and my grandfather, a servant of the king from long ago. I am not a rebel or delinquent in my duty. Here is my act of rebellion, and here is my delinquency. When I entered Gezer, I spoke as followed. The king <laughs> treats us kindly. Now there is indeed no other purpose for me except the service of the king, and whatever the king orders, I obey. So it's amazing to see how Labiah actually transformed originally to this powerful man who was defiant towards the most powerful king on earth, but then basically groveling at the feet of Pharaoh and begging for mercy. It sounds just like the pitiful transformation that takes place over King Saul. 
in the Bible. And so this clearly did not wash with Pharaoh. So time was beginning to run out for Israel's first king. And just like, uh, just like King Saul, Abiah was killed in battle before, um, uh, before Mount Gilboa. So now we even see that there is a warrant for his arrest. Eventually Pharaoh sends out a letter and says, I want this King Leviah captured and I want him dragged in chains so I can have him executed before me. And now this is another Egyptian governor uh, in the Philistine territory writing a letter back to Akhenaten. He says, moreover I, this is his name, Beridea of Megiddo, urge my brother.